There everyone, uh, this is the first in a series of bite-sized videos on employment topics uh, brought to you by the members of the employment team at three Harecourt Chambers. Uh, and today we have uh, myself, uh, Thomas Horton, a barrister at three Harecourt, uh, and we also have Sarah Ibrahim, uh, a barrister at three Harecourt as well. Uh, and the first two um, videos um, or topics being discussed in um, the series uh, is re redundancy. Um, and Sarah, I, I suppose the best place to start is the beginning. And what is redundancy? Absolutely, Tom. Good morning. And to everyone watching this. Well, with redundancy, the first place you need to look is Section 139 of the Employment Rights Act. So, Tom, you may remember back in the day when we used to discuss this, there were three broad things that you're looking for. So either closure of the entire business, closure of that workplace, or you will be looking at a reduced need for that type of work. Now, given the kind of statistics we're seeing about the economy, uh, we're likely to be facing not just a recession, but possibly a depression. So it is very, very likely you're going to be able to say you fall within the terms of redundancy, but it is worth looking at first. And, and, and in terms of you know, the timing of, of this discussion, uh, why are we looking at redundancy now rather than later? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a key question, Tom, because with redundancies at, at the moment, you're, you're probably looking at making a lot of redundancies. And by a lot, I'm talking about, say, 20 or more employees. And that means that you're going to fall under the uh, Trade Union and Labour Relations Act, Section 188. So there will be a duty on you to consult. And that duty means that when you've got 20 or more people that uh, are likely to be made redundant, you're looking at a period of 30 days. If you're making a much larger uh, redundancy of 100 or more people, that extends to 45 days. For those of you who've been following what the Chancellor has been saying, we have a situation where we have this furlough scheme. We've got 8.4 million people on it at the moment, the last government statistics. And that is now going to be tapered. So from August, you're looking at a situation where employers are going to have to start making contributions, firstly to national insurance and pensions, but that's going to increase. So you've got businesses in a very difficult position at the moment where they're just starting to get back trading. They don't know how much money they're going to be able to make um, and their costs are going to be going up. So if you're looking at potential redundancies, now is the right kind of time to be looking at it if you're going to be uh, engaging in large scale collective consultations. So I suppose it's a matter of being proactive rather than merely reactive. Yeah, absolutely. You really, really do need to make sure that when it comes to running your business, you're very on top of the employment law at the moment. And that's not an easy thing because it's changing. And that's what we're here for, isn't it, I suppose? Um, yeah. and, and, and obviously there is redundancy as well, as you've just explained. Um, are there any alternatives that need to be considered as well? Yes, and I, I think this is the first thing people should be looking at. One thing that happened when the Prime Minister Boris Johnson went in front of the Liaison Committee, he was questioned on a whole range of topics. And one of them was, why do we have people and what is a job retention scheme who are being put at risk of redundancy? And Boris Johnson did reply to that, just so I'm not misquoting him. He said, people should not be using furlough cynically to keep people on their books and then get rid of them. We want people back in jobs. So if you have been using the furlough scheme and you've got people um, at risk of redundancy, there may be a chance that in the future you're going to have to justify why you did that. So this is why I wanted to start by looking at what alternatives there may be for you. Brilliant. Um, and I suppose that 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 comment from Johnson really puts some, um, you know, like I say, being proactive really puts the emphasis on the employers you know, to look at the options that they have and, and, you know, really do take that proactive approach about how they deal with issues going forward. I think that's so true because most people have a workforce that they've spent a lot of time investing in. So they, they've trained them, um, they, they've made a, a massive effort to ensure that these are people who are part of their business. So even when you're facing an economic downturn as severe as, as this allegedly is going to be, you do need to look about how you can 
keep as much of that, that workforce as you possibly can. So I think that the first uh, point that really comes to mind is that you should be looking at a recruitment freeze. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, when this pandemic started, I don't think people quite anticipated uh, the scale of it, the global reach of it in particular. So some people would have been about to start or were in the midst of conducting uh, recruitment. So it's about looking at, at whether you can put a freeze on that so you're not adding to your headcount at this time. The second point, which I think is going to be so important for people to look at, is whether you want to look at part-time working arrangements. We live at the moment in a society that values uh, doing five days a week and arguably some people are doing six and may feel like they're doing seven, particularly if you're members of the bar. But mm -hmm. lots of people now, uh, when they've had this protracted period uh, of time at home, will be reassessing what their work-life balance is. And you may find that people are thinking, do I want to do one day work uh, of work at home? rather than from the workplace. And I think, Tom, you could probably see the real potential in that because a lot of companies pay for expensive, usually city sites, to, to make sure that all their employees can be there on one site or, or several sites. If you've got a lot of people who are now thinking about part-time work, the need to have an office space could be reduced either the size of it or you in some organizations they're questioning do we need these expensive offices at all i i completely agree with that i think you know as, as this you know video recording is probably given evidence to the upshot of uh, the pandemic and its effects on, on work are undoubtedly going to be that you know people aren't really going to see the need to have to commute into the office every single day and I think those flexible working uh, approaches are definitely going to be um, something that I looked in in a lot more detail once things are back to a degree of normality um, sooner rather than uh, later. Um, so if that flexible working um, is going to be looked at more so, would that simply mean the contracts that are in place with employees at the moment, would those need to be changed themselves? Uh, well, that's the, the million dollar question, because a lot of people will have signed employment contracts, sometimes years and years um, previously. And I know a lot of clients haven't updated their employment contracts uh, for quite a while. So people are going to have to have a look at those terms and conditions and see whether they do in fact allow the kinds of changes um, that we're suggesting. Uh, the alternative to that is to redraft the terms and conditions so it will allow these kinds of changes you can have this different type of working ideally you want to be consulting um, with your employees so even if you aren't looking at making people redundant even if um, those statutory requirements don't apply it's so important at this time of great uncertainty that you consult with your uh, employees and you take them with you on this process because the very very last option is to terminate employment and then try and re-engage people on those new terms and conditions but i must emphasize that has to be the absolute last thing you want to be doing because that will be exposing you to a potential claim um, of constructive unfair dismissal so ideally you don't want to be doing that you want to be ensuring your your workforce understand why you're making changes and why these are necessary so there, there really is going to be a need for employers to you know, engage proactively, uh, not only um, with, with these potential changes to, to the contracts, well, but then also mm -hmm. if there is no viable alternative, then knocking down the redundancy route as well. Yes, and I think at this time, a lot of people will be making assumptions as to what their employees want to do. And I think given people have had this unprecedented period to reflect on uh, their careers, how everything's structured, that may have changed. So really now is the time to be speaking to your employees. Uh, do they want to be doing things slightly differently? And you may find that some of the solutions to avoiding or at least reducing the need for redundancy may come from your workforce. It's very interesting. And I suppose that brings us to the end of this first part um, of, of this series, looking at redundancy. Um, for the next one, we'll be looking at the situation where there is no viable alternative and then what needs to happen thereafter. That's right. Thanks for the questions, Tom.
Thanks, Sarah.